Hi everyone, my name is Kelvin Lee. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian. And today I have the privilege to talk to you all about PySpec tools, which is an open source library we've been developing that aims to implement Pythonic and deep learning workflows for analyzing broadband spectrum. And so to start off with, I'll kind of set up some scientific context. So in the background, we see the Atacama Large Millimeter Array in Chile, which is one of the premier radio observatories in the world. And so at these facilities, we observe the universe at radio wavelengths, which are relatively low energy photons with a wavelength on the order of millimeter to meters. And there are a couple of distinct advantages of operating in this regime. One of the biggest advantages is that radio waves can quite easily pass through interstellar dust. And so we can see through all the dark patches of the sky as we see in this optical image, which would otherwise be invisible to us. And in the radio band, we are also capable of extremely long baseline interferometry, giving us very high spatial and spe spectral resolution and bandwidth, which in turn lets us study a wide range of phenomena. And to show off some of the science that we're able to do of radio astronomy, the left image is probably an image that a lot of you have probably seen in the news last year which is the first image of a black hole published by the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration. And their experiment combined the efforts of many radio observatories and uh, analytic power to ultimately establish what uh, I believe is a very good baseline of what radio interferometry can achieve. And the images in the center shows a different science case where uh, we're looking at the ejection of molecules from a dying star. So every bit of light here shown corresponds to a signal originating from a specific molecule. And what these images are telling us is basically we can infer a lot of information and a great deal about the dynamics of how uh, stars are born and die. And finally, with radio interferometry, we're also getting a glimpse of how planets may be forming around stars. So in this image, we're looking at the pre how the presence and absence of molecules allows us to infer the formation of clumps that we believe are the early steps to uh, planet formation. And so how do we get these images? Um, the common element behind the last two images I showed are the fact that these images are produced by analyzing the signals of originating from molecules. And so how do we go from radio telescope to molecules? And so first we need to get some telescope with laboratory time and produce some uh, raw spectral data, so frequency and intensity in this case. So we then pre-process the spectra through some digital signal processing and to retrieve the actual signal that we're interested in, followed by peak finding to identify features we need to more closely inspect. We then painstakingly analyze every peak to figure out what the origin of the signal may be. It could be natural phenomena like uh, molecules, or it could be human activity like satellites passing by or somebody's cell phone. So for the natural uh, phenomena, we can perform additional analyses into the line profiles, which allows us to extract additional physical information such as spatial and distri uh, spatial distribution and velocity, which is then transformed into the images you've seen. Ultimately, this is the data that is presented in publications and reports. And so this kind, same kind of workflow more or less applies to both astronomical observations and laboratory analogs of interstellar chemistry, which is the focus of our lab group at the CFA. And so we've established that molecules are actually one of the underpinnings behind a great deal of astrophysical knowledge. They act as extremely sensitive probes, and by relating their physical and chemical properties, we're able to infer a great deal of information about the conditions in a wide range of astrophysical environments. Another interesting way of looking at it is the kind of contrasted scale. We're building up a picture of macroscopic for, uh, phenomena like star and planet formation by studying the signal originating from molecules, which are only on the order of nanometers. And so this kind of knowledge comes at a cost which is the fact that spectra do, unfortunately do not come with labels, otherwise it would be too easy. Conventionally, we have to go through the manual process of matching the observed frequencies, uh, which are characteristic to specific molecules or uh, uh, phenomena, 
with those that are actually published in the literature. And now this would be tractable if it weren't for the number of features that we have to look at manually, which may be on the order of hundreds to thousands. And in many cases, the frequencies may not actually be identifiable because we do simply do not have the data for uh, that particular molecule. As one of the worst case scenarios that we know, to illustrate the, this spectrum shows a, a portion of the Sagittarius B2 North observations with the ERAM 30 meter telescope and overlaid our uh, standard frequency windows that we may get from routine observations. And so these are single uh, observation chunks. Um, you can appreciate the number and the density of lines that we have to analyze in order to finally get to the scientific information. Now, this is also compounded by the fact that radio instruments are continually improving and quite quickly as well. Uh, more bandwidth and resolution gives us substantially more data and more science, but at the cost of uh, requiring more analysis. And so as an example, the wideband, and sub uh, wideband upgrade to the submillimeter array promises 64 gigahertz of instantaneous bandwidth, which is eight times what's shown here in the single acquisition. And so to put this into context, the entire spectrum uh, that was published for this uh, observing campaign uh, overlaid is the 64 gigahertz of um, bandwidth that's promised by the WSMA. And so you can appreciate how this problem was rapidly spinning out of control. And we can't keep, possibly keep up with manual analysis. And not only do we have to keep up with the acquisition rate, then because that our data is published, we have an obligation to ensure that every step of our workflow is both reproducible and accountable. And the key to solving both of these problems, we believe, is through automation. And so to help solve these problems, we've been developing PySpec tools as a means to help automate spectral uh, analysis with three main goals. The first is to provide any user who's used to spectroscopy with a familiar abstraction to make the analysis process more natural and streamlined. We also want to encourage best practices for reproducibility and collaboration in spectroscopic analysis. And finally, we'd like to improve the quality and volume of information we can process by augmenting workflows with deep learning models. And so ultimately, we're trying to help improve the throughput of um, spectral analysis and push the time it takes to otherwise manually uh, analyze spectra uh, completely from months down to hours and in the future, maybe even in real time. And so in this talk, I'll be providing a very high level overview of how the library was designed and can be used to design automated workflows and uh, spectral analysis, which work to correlate literature data with experiments. I'll also be talking about how we're designing deep learning models to help perform exploratory analysis of unidentifiable features as a means to help new discoveries. So spectral analysis pi spectals revolves around three core abstractions. The first, we have the assignment session class, which acts as a main user interface with spectral data. Second, we have the transition class, which acts as a low level representation of spectral features. And third, we have line list, which is a bridging interface between the transition and assignment session classes. And so on the right, we can see how the core components of spectral analysis are brought together with PySpec tools. The first you load in a spectrum, including its metadata, you then perform some pre-processing and peak detection. You can then load in a literature catalog of frequencies and then correlate them with the features you've observed in your own spectrum. And so a transition object stores data about the peak or a catalog entry as attributes. So for example, the line frequency and intensity. Also, which experiment or source or catalog that we've observed this transition in and whether or not it's been identified. In the case of molecules as well, we have additional fields that help identify the specific molecule, including the name, the formula, and the smiles identifier, as well as information regarding the quantum mechanical states associated with the feature, such as the quantum numbers and the state energies. 
The assignment session acts as the main form of user interaction for the analysis. We use pandas to handle the spectral data, giving us convenient ways to parse common file formats and perform efficient computation and serialization. We also have access to functions to perform signal processing and peak detection by wrapping functionality from SciPy and peak utils, as well as some uh, custom functions in our library. And because this library was designed with notebook environments in mind, we also have interfaces with Plotly to make interactive plots. And finally, we use Pickle to serialize the entire analysis. And while Pickle is not necessarily the gold standard in security, this is a crucial part of our workflow as we'll discuss later. The line list class moderates transitions and assignment sessions by automating and handling how assignments are made. We can automate the creation of many transitions by parsing standard file formats like catalogs or by querying an online database through Astro Query. We can then pass this line list object into a assignment session through the process line list function and it will then automatically correlate all the observed features with those in a specified catalog. And in the case of many assignments, you can use YAML to define metadata for every catalog used. So for example, multiple identifiers like the formula and the smiles, and a bid text citation key for subsequent table generation. A similar syntax is then used to run it through the assignment session. So to put it all together, we've designed this process to form a modular pipeline where we break up each subsequent step into a single script or notebook, depending on its functionality. So the first script does the baseline and peak detection, and then the second script runs through all the user-defined catalogs. And this dotted line now indicates that the assignment session is serialized and becomes more or less read-only, so that all the analysis afterwards uses only the serialized assignment session data to make figures and line profile analysis. A final script then uses the assignment session data to export all the analysis into CSVs, tech tables, and an interactive report that streamlines the whole process of sharing data with collaborators or putting them on platforms like Zenodo. And an advantage of using a pipeline is that you can batch automate analysis of many spectra with tools like paper mill. Once you've set up your pipeline the first time, you don't have to do it again and just repeat the same procedure. And to kind of show off some of the outputs, this uh, embedding shows the automated uh, report generation steps, which creates a self-containing interactive HTML that summarizes our analysis. The actual HTML is embedded here and shows some of the experiment metadata and the results. So the top plot shows how much progress has been made in assigning the spectrum. And so in this example, 979 features have been assigned to real molecules, 45 to our artifacts out of the possible 1158 uh, spectral features that we've seen in this experiment. The overview spectrum is also a good way to visualize what has been done in this uh, experiment and to look for things that haven't necessarily been picked up by the analysis that should have as a way of sanity checking. And subsequently, the tables, assignments, and unidentified lines uses uh, JavaScript for framework data tables to make these tables interactive and searchable. And the philosophy behind generating this uh, HTML report is so that we can share the analysis with people who don't necessarily use Python for their analysis. Uh, everyone has a web browser and will be able to review what has been done in the analysis without having to go through setting up the same Python environment. And we think this is a good way to help foster collaboration by allowing anyone without Python to also access the uh, uh, analysis quite easily. So to finalize the API description, we and several other groups have been using PySpectals to analyze laboratory experiments of interstellar chemistry, which you can see in these example uh, papers. The library, I think, has really kind of streamlined the way our lab analyzes broadband spectra and in turn has actually facilitate, facilitated the discovery of lots of new molecules in the last year. Um, Another thing we'd like to promote is the version tracking with Zenodo, 
which is automated by pushing new GitHub releases that automates the generation of new DOIs that can subsequently be cited. And so in the next part of the talk, we're going to look at how we're using deep learning to process spectral data and discover new molecules. In the previous section, we covered how PySpectals helps keep track of identifiable features, but the remaining unknown signals can potentially contain a lot of information that we're simply missing. And so the process of making unknown signals known is actually shown in this diagram. With the leftover unidentified features from PySpectals, we have to then be able to find groups of frequencies that likely form a set together. We can then fit these sets to a physical model to obtain a set of spectroscopic encodings, or A, B, and C, which are then proportional to the moments of inertia of a molecular structure. So this is the process of uh, linking a set of possible structures to a set of frequencies. The dotted lines here show an increase in dimensionality, where the previous step can actually potentially map onto multiple solutions non-uniquely. And so what we're ending up with is are, are actually two problems that we're trying to solve. The first of which is, which frequencies form a set? And the second, what is the molecular identity of a, any given set? And the way we're going about solving these problems is with, with the probabilistic deep learning. Many of you are probably familiar with neural networks as universal function approximators, but regular deterministic uh, models can only map a single value uh, to another. So from X, we get the uh, most likely value of Y back, and that's all we ever get. Because there's a potential different, uh, there's a potential for many different structures. Uh, for example, in our previous application, we need to be able to move to a probabilistic framework where a single uh, input can map to a distribution of outputs weighted by their likelihood. So in this example, X maps onto a P of Y. The distribution in return also provides a measure of uncertainty, which is essential for any kind of uh, quantitative problem. And so to kind of rephrase the previous two questions in a probabilistic sense, we're now interested in asking how likely is one answer over another? And so for example, what the chance of my molecule corresponding to structure A instead of, uh, in instead of structure B, given our uh, set of spectroscopic parameters? And so as an example, when it comes to identifying molecules, we've developed a uh, probabilistic neural network that uses spectroscopic parameters and predicts the possible range of chemical formulas and what functional groups might be present. We use dropouts as an approximation to Bayesian sampling and transforms an otherwise deterministic model to produce samples from an approximate posterior. So this model was trained on a quantum chemistry data set of 83,000 small mo organic molecules. One of the nice regularization steps we took to ensure that the model generalizes well was to use Bayesian uncertainties of the quantum chemistry data to augment the training process. And combining this information with chemical intuition, we can start postulating uh, possible structures that correspond directly from whatever information we give the model to uh, possibly uh, molecular, uh, possible molecular structures. Ultimately, we would actually like to go directly from parameters to structures, but this is still an ongoing uh, development. Um, but besides that, we've since published this framework and you can actually find the details of the paper, uh, including in this link below. So since publishing the work, we've now included a model that performs variational inference into pi spectrums including the pre-trained model weights, as well as the PyTorch code that defines the model itself. We've wrapped all this functionality up into a high-level uh, interface in PySpectals, and also provided example notebooks in the docs on how to perform inference using your own um, spectroscopic data. We've implemented this in a way such that users that don't necessarily need a knowledge of deep learning. And thanks to the abstraction of uh, provided by PyTorch, you can easily scale these calculations from CPUs to GPUs. Although in our tests, um, you could easily perform these with uh, regular uh, laptop CPUs as well. 
And so when it comes to figuring out what frequencies form a set, you can actually quite easily appreciate how difficult this might be using only frequency information. So to illustrate, if you were to have 200 frequencies and to pick six randomly, there are 59 trillion possible permutations. And with a small modest increase in the number of frequencies to consider, we can get trillions more possible permutations. And so this scales extremely poorly with the number of unknown frequencies. A brute force approach would be to form uh, random sets and perform least squares fit to uh, our physical models, whereby we then use the residual error to score the set. And given the possible number of combinations, this is somewhat impractical. Even if it was uh, practical, it wouldn't be particularly inefficient. Uh, furthermore, repeated least squares fits to the models do not necessarily tell you how likely the answer is uh, to be the real one since we have no real estimation of uncertainty based on only the residual error. What we'd like to do instead is kind of mimic how spectroscopists solve the problem, which is to combine intuition and pattern recognition to find sets within your uh, unknown frequencies. And so we're going to try and use deep reinforcement learning to automate an intelligent way of uh, strategically assigning spectra in an automated fashion. The motivation behind this framework is to have a computer do what a trained spectroscopist would do, to look for patterns in the spectra and to decide whether it, or not to add a frequency or remove a frequency from the set and eventually converge onto an answer. So in a deep reinforcement learning framework, you can model this process as a Markov decision process where both the state and the policy models are parameterized by recurrent neural networks. And so the unknown frequencies from our pi spectrals output and your uh, assigned set together describe the state. And we can use a recurrent neural network to generate encodings of both the un unknown and assigned frequencies, which are then fed to the policy model that then decides what the best course of action is. We've since finished developing the recurrent encoder model, and we're now actively developing the reinforcement learning framework. As part of this, we're actually developing a general a gym analog for spectral analysis. So people who are familiar with OpenAI reinforcement learning gym, we're doing something similar to so that other groups can implement their own strategies for different spectroscopic uh, reinforcement learning applications. And so to kind of wrap up the talk, what you've seen today represents a very high level overview of what PySpec tools is designed to do which is to help automate spectroscopic analysis and try and improve its reproducibility through both a combination of Python and deep learning. The library so far has really streamlined the way our group and several others have been analyzing their spectral data. And we're actively developing both the library as well as uh, new deep learning models. And ultimately, I believe that it would be helpful to extend this capability to other wavelengths for both astronomical and laboratory data. And so of course we are open to uh, both co uh, contributions and collaborations. I'd like to uh, thank the um, acknowledged funding from both NASA and NSF and the CFA for being my uh, postdoctoral host. And of course the SciPy organizing committee and reviewers for giving me the opportunity to speak. I learned a lot of, from these videos ever since I was a graduate student. And so this is kind of like a dream come true for me. I'd also like to take the time to thank the open source community for doing what they do. Many of us would not be able to do what is relatively mundane and routine analysis and probably live a large amount of my life without open source contrib uh, contributions. And so I'd like to thank everyone who writes code for the benefit of others. And of course, thank you for your attention.